So today we're going to be taking a look at uh, lab number three, the oscilloscope. Uh, the objective of the exercise really is to just become familiar with the oscilloscope. So in the theory overview section of the lab, they uh, talk a little bit about the oscilloscope, saying it's really kind of a uh, voltmeter that just shows the voltage over a period of time. Uh, one of the things we have to keep in mind, it has to be a repetitive signal to show up on the oscilloscope. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, they're also saying that it's not quite like a handheld voltmeter or the voltmeters on our benches. Uh, with our voltmeters, we can put it in a circuit anywhere with a, an oscilloscope. The uh, ground terminal is actually physically connected to the uh, mains ground and uh, if you put uh, extra grounds in your circuit you end up shorting it out. So under equipment we have two different oscilloscopes in our lab rooms. We have the TDS-210 and we also have the TDS-1002. Uh, They're a little bit different from each other even though they look very similar. So today we're going to be using the DC power supply which is the Agilent E3630A we're going to be using the function generator for the first time so our function generators are made by circuit test and they're the SWF 7000s the uh, digital multimeter uh, the MassTech MSM 9803 and the oscilloscope is going to be the Textronic it's either going to be the TDS 210 or the TDS 1002 so whichever one you have in front of you that will be the model number that we're going to be putting down. We're going to be using two resistors today, a 10k ohm and a 33k ohm resistor. And on today's schematic, you can see there's the 10k and the 33k. So if you take a look at the voltage divider law that we did in uh, first semester, you can see the voltage here is approximately three quarters of the applied voltage and this would be one quarter of the applied voltage. So my first resistor is 10.02k ohms. So my second resistor is 32.69k ohms and it's always a good idea to test your components before you put them in a circuit just to make sure that they are within tolerance and that you have connected up the correct component. So you can see I've recorded the uh, model numbers for the equipment I'm going to be using. I haven't bothered with the uh, serial numbers because they're too hard to find. And I've actually measured my resistors just to make sure I have the right resistors and that they're not defective. Now, wiring up my circuit, you can see I have a 10 volt supply, a 10k, a 33k ohm resistor, and that goes back to common. I'm going to be putting my oscilloscope channel 1 lead on the junction where the 10 volts comes into the 10k ohm resistor and I'm going to put the oscilloscope channel 2 lead at the junction between the 10k and the 33k ohm resistors. So I just wanted to show you my circuit wired up. You can see here is a 10k ohm resistor here is a 33k ohm resistor. I have the red lead going to the same bus line that goes to my 10k ohm resistor. I have the trailing end of my uh, 33k ohm resistor going to the black lead. And I've wired up a yellow lead at the junction of the 10k and the 33k ohm resistor because that's where we need to take another reading from and it's a lot easier to plug banana leads into the uh, binding posts than it is to try and put an alligator clip on here and take a measurement so because I'm going to be spending a lot of time pressing buttons and rotating dials on the oscilloscope I don't want to have to worry about my alligator lead falling off or making contact with other leads so I'm going to use a binding post at the midpoint so all my readings can be taken from the common coming in on the bottom of the 33 k ohm resistor and the junction of the 10 k and the 33 k and where it comes into my circuit 
on the top of the 10K. So on procedure part one, uh, I've shown you in figure 3-1 a, uh, basically it's a sketch of an oscilloscope. This is the TDS-220. Uh, it's very similar to our oscilloscopes. And all I want you to do is to actually locate some of these items that are on the list here. And I've labeled them with a capital letter on the sketch. These letters do not appear on your oscilloscope. So don't try looking for the letters. Look for the actual knob. And when you get down to item J that says default setup, that's this position right here. That is only available on the TDS-1002. So I just wanted to show you our oscilloscope leads. Uh, they're fairly long, so that they can stretch from the uh, oscilloscope to the uh, trainer. Uh, one end you're familiar with, we have the black and red uh, banana type leads. So those will plug into your trainer. At the other end here, we have a BNC connector. B stands for bayonet, so it actually goes on and gets twisted, and then it'll hold on and it won't fall off. So you can see the outer portion of the BNC connector is metal, and that is your ground, and that connects to the black banana lead. And in the center here, we have a little pin, that goes into the oscilloscope and that connects to the red banana lead. So all oscilloscopes have these type of uh, BNC connectors on them. So this is the connector for channel 1 and this is the connector for channel 2 and nearly all oscilloscopes have some kind of external triggering connection and that's also a uh, bayonet type connector or BNC connector. To plug a cable into a BNC connector you can see that there is a little dot up here and it protrudes that's part of the bayonet type thing and you can see on the connector it slides in here and then the whole connector twists to lock it into place. So you line up the little slot with a little dot on the connector you slide it on. You have to give it a push because it's spring-loaded and then you twist it and then it won't pull out. So from procedure one, this is our Textronic TDS-210 oscilloscope and item A, we're looking for channel one and channel two BNC input connectors. So those are our two input connectors. B, we're looking for the external trigger BNC connector. C, we're looking for the channel 1 and channel 2 menu buttons. So that's the channel 1 menu, channel 2 menu. Part D, we're looking for the horizontal scale. So that's this knob here. And it should have a position knob to go with it. We're looking for the vertical scales, so that's the channel 1 and channel 2 vertical scales and the position knobs that go with them. Over here we have the trigger level knob. We're looking for the math menu button, so that's here between channel 1 and channel 2. We're looking for the cursor buttons and the cursor button works with the vertical position buttons for channel 1 and channel 2. We're looking for the save recall button which is over here. We're looking for the auto set button which is here and we're looking for J the default setup button which is right here and it's missing on our TDS-210. So this is our TDS-1002 oscilloscope and it has all the same connectors and buttons as the TDS-210 but you'll notice when you get to item J there is a default setup button right here.
but it's only on the TDS 1002. So under procedure two, we're going to turn on the oscilloscope. It takes a few minutes to power up. Um, there are five buttons down the side of the screen, and these five buttons relate to these menu items on the screen. So when your screen first comes up, we don't know what these items are going to say, so everybody's oscilloscope could say something different. So this is another oscilloscope I've just powered up, and you can see its menu buttons down the side of the screen, and it has different items showing. So where the other oscilloscope said type voltage, this says coupling DC. So depending on what menu buttons you press, what displays on the side of the screen will be totally different. It says note that the main display is similar to a sheet of graph paper, so you can see going over there are actual divisions across the screen and there's divisions going up the screen. So this is the TDS 210. I'm going to do a factory reset on it. To do that, I press the save recall button And you'll notice the menu on the side of the screen changes. So make sure that it, you are in Setups. So if I press this side menu button here, it'll change to Waveforms. It needs to be in Setups. And then press the Factory Recall button. Now it says in the bottom of the screen, it says factory setup recalled, and then it disappears. So we've now reset this oscilloscope to the factory reset defaults. So on the TDS 1002, to do a factory default setup, what we're going to do is press the default setup button. You have to wait for it. It says default setup recalled in the bottom corner. And now it's done the default setup for you. So moving on to step three under procedure. I'm going to press the channel one menu button. And on here you can see we have DC coupling, bandwidth limit, volts per division, and probe is on times 10. So the probes we're going to be using are times one probes. So press the side menu button and it says 100 times, press it again. It says 1000 times, press it again and it says times one. So we need to do this again for the channel two. Its probe is on times 10, so press the button for times 100 times a thousand times one. Now they want us to press the auto set button. The auto set button is right here. Press it. And you can see that we've got two traces on the oscilloscope. So there's two traces on the oscilloscope. You'll notice there's a one by the channel one trace. There's a two by the channel two trace and there's a little arrow beside it. That indicates that it's at zero volts. So I just pressed the auto set on the TDS 1002. You can see that there is only one trace for channel one. It says channel one and the settings for channel one. So only one channel was detected for it. So if I press the channel two menu button, you can see channel two shows up. Now I have channel 1 on top of channel 2. So if I use the position adjustment knob, I can move channel 1 up two divisions, and I can move channel 2 down two divisions. So you can see channel 1 is on 50 millivolts per division. Channel 2 is 50 millivolts per division. What that means is every vertical division represents 50 millivolts. So that's 50 millivolts 
100 millivolts, 150 millivolts from the zero line on the bottom trace. We can see the time per division is one millisecond. So every one of these squares is one millisecond, two milliseconds, three milliseconds from this center trace. The center trace has a little arrow above it. That indicates where it's triggered at. So if I change the horizontal position knob, you can see the little arrow at the top has now moved over. So that's where the waveform is going to start at. I'm going to turn clockwise the channel 1 volts per division knob. And you can see the volts per division has changed to 20 millivolts per division. If I rotate it clockwise again, it's now 10 millivolts per division. Rotating it counterclockwise, you can see it will now display more volts per division. What they're saying is the volts are in one, so that's one volt, two, two volts, five, five volts. Now looking at the time at the bottom, it now says one millisecond. So if I rotate the seconds per division knob counterclockwise, it now says 2.5 milliseconds. And if I rotate it counterclockwise again, it now becomes 5 milliseconds. So you can see the voltages increment in steps of 1, 2, and 5. Whereas the time or seconds per division knob increments at one, two and a half, and then five and repeats itself. So under procedure, we're going to move on to step number four. So if I press the channel one menu button, you can see I've got some menu items down the side here that I can select from. We've already selected the probe at times one. We should now change the coupling so if I press the top button, I can see I've got AC coupling. That's for sine waves without any DC signal. I've got ground, which is a completely flat line. And I've got DC. So that shows the DC waveform and the AC waveform. If I press the channel 2 menu button, it now says channel 2 at the top and it has DC coupling, bandwidth limit off, volts per division course, probe times 1 and invert off. So moving on to step 5 under procedure. So in step 5 they want us to adjust the volts per division knob so that channel 1 is on 5 volts per division and channel 2 we want on 2 volts per division. And that displays in the bottom of the screen. We're going to set the time for horizontal to 1 millisecond. So that'll display in the bottom of the screen. We want to set the uh, input coupling to DC for both channels. So for channel 1, coupling is DC. Channel 2, Coupling is DC. Then we want to align the display lines to the center line of the display via the vertical position knob. So these two lines we want on the center of the graph. So I'll use this position knob to bring down channel 1 so it's exactly on the center line. And then I'll use the channel 2 position knob to make sure that that line is directly in the center as well. It says note that pushing the vertical position knob, so that's the vertical position knob, ours don't push. So on some oscilloscopes all of these knobs you can push them to set it back to a center position or a default position. Mm -hmm. 
our oscilloscopes do not have a push function on our knobs. So under procedure, step six, we're now going to build the circuit and connect it to our oscilloscope. So I've connected the black lead to common, the red lead to plus 20, and they go to my circuit. I've adjusted the voltage adjustment knob for the plus 20 volt terminal with the meter set on plus 20. I've got it at exactly 10 volts. So over on my oscilloscope, I've plugged in a BNC to banana lead in channel 1 and a BNC to banana lead in channel 2. On my circuit, you can see the black wire that goes to the bottom of the 33k ohm resistor has the lead from the power supply and the two black banana leads from the oscilloscope just stacked together. The red banana lead coming from my power supply goes to the red lead that goes to the 10k ohm resistor and the red banana lead from channel 1 of the oscilloscope piggybacks into the back of the lead coming from the power supply. The red banana lead from channel 2 of the oscilloscope goes to the yellow wire that measures the voltage at the midpoint between the 10k and the 33k ohm resistor. So looking at my oscilloscope screen, you can see both waveforms deflected upwards. The channel 1 waveform is on 5 volts per division, so it went up 1, 2 divisions, so 2 times 5 equals 10 volts. So that was the input voltage to my circuit. Channel 2 is on 2 volts per division, and you can see its waveform is almost at the top of the screen. So it went up 1, 2, 3, almost 4 divisions. So each division is worth 2 volts, so 2 times 4, it's almost up 8 volts. And you can see on the simulation I provided for you, it should be 7.67 volts. And on the oscilloscope screen, it's almost 8 volts. Now you'll notice the voltage across R1, I have simulated to be 2.33 volts. With an oscilloscope, we could not measure this voltage drop because if I put the plus lead on this side, I'll have the 10 volts. And if I put the negative lead on this side, I will now short out this resistor because I now have two grounds in my circuit. So another way to see this voltage is to take the input voltage and subtract the output voltage. So if I take channel 1 voltage, subtract channel 2 voltage, I should end up with 2.33 volts. So 10 coming in minus 7.67 volts should leave me with 2.33 volts. So I'm going to show you how to do that on the oscilloscope. So my first step is going to be to change both channel 1 and channel 2 to the same volts per division. So on channel 2, I'm going to rotate the volts per division knob counterclockwise so that they're now both on 5 volts per division. I'm going to press the math menu button and you can see the operation is minus if I press this button I can change it to plus so it's at minus is channel 1 minus channel 2 so you can see the waveform is up about half a division so half of 5 volts is going to be two and a half volts it's extremely important when you use the math function that both channel 1 and channel 2 are on the same volts per division also in step 7 of the procedure they want us to calculate the expected voltage across R2 using measured resistor values and compare the two in table 3.1. 
So my measured resistor values were 10.02K and 32.69K. So using the voltage divider rule, I can take my 32.69K and divide it by 10.02 plus 32.69K times 10 volts. So I expect to see 7.65 volts. So in table 3.1, for the voltage across resistor 2, we can see that our oscilloscope scale was set at 2 volts per division. The number of divisions it covered, it went up 3 divisions and 4 fifths of a division. So the voltage for the oscilloscope is 3 times 2 volts per division, which equals 6 volts, plus 4 fifths of a division, so it's 4 fifths times 2 volts per division, equals 1.6 volts, so 6 plus 1.6 equals 7.6 volts. So we'll record that in table 3.1. Comparing it to my calculated value of 7.65, you can see the voltage on the oscilloscope is not quite as accurate as we would like it to be. So under step 7 of the procedure, we're going to double check the results using a DMM and record these in the final column of table 3.1. And then we're going to sketch the waveform on plot 3.1. So on my DMM, you can see that the input voltage is 10 volts. And the voltage across my 33k ohm resistor is 7.59 volts. So recording my voltage from the DMM, you can see it's 7.59 volts compared to approximately 7.6 on the oscilloscope. So the DMM is a little more accurate. However, the DMM will not work at higher frequencies. And the oscilloscope will work at higher frequencies, but it's a little less accurate taking a reading right off the oscilloscope screen. So the last part of step number 7 under procedure is to sketch the waveform on plot 3.1. So on plot 3.1 you can see for volts per division, channel 1, 5 volts, volts per division, channel 2, 2 volts, and seconds per division, 1 millisecond. I've drawn in my zero line for reference, so my zero line usually goes through the center of my screen. I've drawn in the channel 1 line and labeled it as 10 volts. So it went up 1, 2 divisions, 2 times 5 is 10 volts. And I've drawn in my channel 2 line, and you can see it went up 1, 2, 3, not quite 4 divisions. 2 times 4 is 8, so I labeled it 7.6 volts. So when I come back later and look at this chart, I can kind of understand what's going on. Now in step number 8, while we have the DC voltages on the screen, we're going to select the AC coupling for the two inputs. So on my screen, I'm going to press the channel 1 menu button. And where it says coupling, I'm going to select AC, and you can see the channel 1 drop down to my zero line. I'm going to press the channel 2 menu button, and where it says DC, I'm going to press the button, and you can see the channel 2 voltage line drop down to the zero volts. That's because there's no AC voltage going into our circuit, there's only a DC voltage and the oscilloscope has filtered out the DC voltage. So under procedure, step number 9, we're going to replace the DC power supply with the function generator. So to replace the power supply, start by turning it off and then disconnecting the red banana lead and then the black banana lead from your circuit. To connect the function generator, we're going to take a third BNC to banana lead and the red banana lead piggybacks onto channel 1 of the oscilloscope 
and the black banana lead plugs into the black banana leads of channel 1 and channel 2. We then take the BNC end and plug it into the function generator where it says output. We now need to set the function generator for a 1 volt peak sine wave at 1 kilohertz and apply it to the resistor network. So this is our circuit test uh, function generator and the power button is located over here. This is the output. You notice we have three BNC connectors. One's for a count in, one's for a sync out, and the last one is our output and that's the one that we're going to be using. We have multiplier buttons all the way across here. So we want a 1 kilohertz signal, so press in the times 1K button. We want a sine wave, so on the functions, press in the sine wave. Now all these other buttons across here, they do have a pull out setting and a push in setting. So make sure all of these buttons are in the pushed in setting. On this particular function here, it's called the sweep function. We have a center knob and we can take it out of calibration by turning it clockwise. Make sure it's turned all the way counterclockwise until it clicks into position. If we're trying to count things, this button would be pressed in. You notice the display says zero. We want it in the out position. So just to recap, the power is on. We want the sine wave function that's pressed in. The times 1K, press that in. OSC button, we want it in the out position. All these buttons are pushed in. And this button here rotates all the way counterclockwise. This big knob here is for changing the frequency. So if I turn it clockwise, the frequency increases. If I turn it counterclockwise, the frequency decreases. So we want to decrease it until it says 1 kilohertz. There's two displays on here. The light is in the upper display. That's for kilohertz. The lower display would be for hertz. So we want one kilohertz, so we want the top light on. We're using the same BNC to banana leads that we use for the oscilloscope. So I'll show you how they're plugged into the circuit right now. So this is the red banana lead from the function generator. This is the black lead from the function generator. All the black leads stack together. So if you can keep that in mind, all the black leads go together. You'll never have a problem shorting out any of your supplies. Channel 1 of the oscilloscope looks at the total voltage across your circuit. And that's where your function generator plugs into. So this is what my screen looks like. Everybody's screen is going to look a little bit different depending on the setting of your amplitude. This is the amplitude control knob. And you can rotate it counterclockwise for lower voltage. Turn it clockwise for larger voltage. Rotate your knob so that it's about halfway, pointing straight up. So this is what my oscilloscope screen looks like. And you can see channel 1 is on 5 volts per division. So I'm going to press channel 2 to take away the channel 2 display. So now all I'm looking at is the channel 1 display. This is my input voltage. So my channel 1 is still on 5 volts per division from the last exercise, so I'm going to turn it clockwise until I get to 1 volt per division.
you'll notice my waveform goes off the screen. So I'm now going to adjust the amplitude knob on my function generator. I'm going to rotate it counterclockwise, reducing the amplitude of the sine wave. So we want the sine wave to be one volt per division. So we've now set the function generator for a one volt peak sine wave. So that is one volt peak. Not peak to peak. Peak to peak is two volts. So we want a one volt peak sine wave. Now I can change my channel one volts per division by rotating the knob clockwise one more click. I'm now at 500 millivolts per division. And I can adjust my amplitude to make sure that that waveform just touches the second line up. So that's half a volt, that's one volt. So we're trying to get a one volt peak sine wave. It says if the display is very blurry, we can adjust the trigger level. So ours is triggered correctly. This arrow right here and this arrow right here points to the trigger points. So we're triggering right at that point there. If I rotate the trigger level knob clockwise, you can see that this little arrow moves upwards. If I move the trigger level above the waveform, the waveform just starts flying by my screen. It doesn't know where the trigger point is. It thinks the trigger point is right here and that's just above the waveform. So your trigger point needs to be down in the waveform. So I'm going to adjust the trigger level counterclockwise. And once it gets into the waveform, it stops wiggling across. Now I'm going to press the channel 1 menu. And you can see my couplings on AC. And the bandwidth limit is off. If I put the bandwidth limit on, it's on at 20 megahertz. And you can see that it clears up the sine wave just a little bit. I can also change it to 60 megahertz. Sometimes that cleans up the signal further. And sometimes 20 is a better setting. My probe is on times one and it's not inverted. If you press the invert button, notice this is the positive peak right now. Now it becomes the negative peak. So you don't want to have invert on. So my invert is off and there's my positive peak. Now they want us to adjust the time scale so we only get one or two cycles of the wave. So my seconds per division, I'm going to rotate it clockwise. And you can see it kind of opens up the sine wave. So I'm going to rotate it one more stop. So now I'm getting approximately two cycles of my sine wave. If I start at a zero crossing line, that is one cycle. That is two cycles. So I have my oscilloscope set to 250 microseconds. I'm now going to press the channel 2 menu button and that brings in my other waveform. Now to compare the two waveforms they need to both be on the same setting. So you can see channel 1 is on 500 millivolts with the bandwidth limit on. Channel 2 is at 2 volts. So I'm going to adjust my volts per division for channel 2. to 500 millivolts. 
So continuing on in step 9 under procedure, it says using the scale settings determine the two voltages. Now we're going to follow the method of step 7 and we want the waveforms period and we're going to record these results in table 3, 2 and 3, 3. So the big waveform is the input waveform. So I'm going to press channel 2 menu button and it eliminates the second waveform. So this is just my input waveform. And we can see the input waveform goes up one, two divisions, and it goes down one, two divisions. So each division is worth 500 millivolts, so it goes up one volt, and it goes down one volt. So it peaks at one volt. So pressing channel 2 menu button brings back the channel 2 waveform. Press the channel 1 menu button takes away our input waveform. Now it's hard to read on this scale exactly how far up our waveform goes, but if we move it over to the center scale we'll have a better idea of what that peak is going to be. So adjusting the horizontal position knob, we can adjust our waveform so that the peak crosses the center line. Once your peak crosses the center line, you can now see that it goes up one whole division and it goes up one two small divisions so it goes up one and two-fifths of a division I'm going to press the channel one menu button to bring back my main waveform and press my channel two menu button to so I'm left with one waveform I'm going to readjust the position so that the waveform goes right through the center of the zero lines. So it's gone through the center of my zero lines. The period covers one complete cycle. So this is considered one complete cycle. One complete cycle covers one, two, three, four divisions. And we're on 250 microseconds. So the period is 4 times 250 microseconds, or 1 millisecond. Now the next thing they want us to do is to measure the voltage with a DMM. So we're going to rotate the knob one stop clockwise till it's on the volts with a little sine wave and on it. And I'm going to put on the backlighting. So this is my total voltage applied to the circuit, measured on the DMM and you can see it's 0.689 volts so the voltage across the 33 k ohm resistor is 0.526 volts so you can see on table 3.2 I've recorded the scale or volts per division for E which is the input voltage on channel 1 is 500 millivolts per division the scale for Channel 2 is 500 millivolts per division. Channel 1 went up two divisions. So 2 times 500 millivolts is 1 volt. And channel 2 went up 1 and 2 fifths of a division, which works out to 700 millivolts. I've done my measurements with the DMM. So we now have to convert our 1 volt peak into RMS. To do that, we multiply 1 times 0.707. So we should end up with 707 millivolts. The same thing for channel 2. We had 700 millivolts times 
will equal 495 millivolts. So the 707 compares to the 689 we got on the DMM. And the 495 compares to the 526 we got on the DMM. So on table 3.3, the scale is 250 microseconds. The number of divisions was 4. So 4 times 250 microseconds equals 1,000 microseconds, which is 1 millisecond. And lastly, the frequency is equal to 1 over the period, so 1 over 1 millisecond is 1 kilohertz. So the last part of uh, step 9 under procedure is to sketch the waveforms on plot 3.2. So you can see on plot 3.2, I've written in my volts per division as 500 millivolts for channel 1 and 500 millivolts for channel 2, and we're at 250 microseconds. I've sketched in my waveforms as best as I can. You'll notice I highlighted my zero lines so I could see where they were and then I tried to determine where my peaks were going to be and then sketched in my waveforms using those peaks. I've also labeled channel 1 and I've labeled channel 2 so that when I come back in a few months time to review my work I can figure out which waveforms which. So moving on to step 10 of the procedure we're going to find the voltage across R1 and remember, we can't measure it directly with an oscilloscope because we'd be adding another ground to our circuit and shorting out the 33k ohm resistor. So we're going to show you how to do that using the math function. So to find the voltage across R1, the channel 2 voltage may be subtracted from channel 1 via the math function. So we're going to press the math menu button. And you can see the operation is going to be minus and we want channel 1 minus channel 2 and you can see we now have a third waveform on our screen that third waveform is channel 1 minus channel 2 so you can see the third waveform which is the voltage across R1 goes up 1, 2, 2.5 of 5 so it goes up 250 millivolts. We now need to sketch this waveform on plot 3.3. .3. Now we're to remove the math waveform before proceeding to the next step. So press the math menu button and the waveform disappears. So on plot 3.3 .3, you can see I've drawn in my three waveforms and I've highlighted my smaller waveform and I've labeled these as channel 1 being equal to the applied voltage channel 2 being equal to the voltage drop across R2 and the last one is the math function which is equal to the voltage drop across R1 when you're doing the math function it's extremely important that both channel 1 and channel 2 are set to the same volts per division. For procedure, step number 11, what we're going to be doing is adding a DC offset to our waveform and sketching it on plot 3-4. So on our function generator we've been using the sine wave, we also have the triangle wave and the square wave. So I'll show you what those three look like on the oscilloscope. So for step 11, we only need one waveform on the oscilloscope, so I'm going to press the channel 2 menu button to take away the second waveform. So now we have just the input waveform. So we're looking at a sine wave. If I press in the triangle wave button on the function generator, you can see we now have a triangle wave and if I press the square wave button, you can see we now have a square wave. So back on our function generator, we started off by pushing all the knobs in. Now this is our DC offset control. And it's labeled DC offset and it says pull on. So if you pull 
the knob out. We're now going to be adding DC offset to our waveform. So if we rotate it counterclockwise, we'll be adding negative DC offset. If we rotate it clockwise, we'll be adding positive DC offset. So starting with the knob approximately in the center position, we will now adjust our waveform on the oscilloscope. To see the DC offset that we're going to put into our waveform, we have to change the coupling to DC. So that's ground, that's DC. Now on the function generator, pull out the DC offset knob. And try to adjust your knob so it's kind of centered. Now rotating the knob clockwise should add DC offset to my waveform. And if you add too much DC offset, it will go above your trigger line. So you need to adjust your trigger level knob until the trigger arrow is in part of your waveform. If you rotate the DC offset knob counterclockwise, you can reduce the amount of DC offset. And once again, you'll go below your trigger line. So you'll need to adjust your trigger level knob on your oscilloscope until the arrow is into the waveform. Let's add 500 millivolts of DC offset to our waveform and sketch it. So I've highlighted my zero crossing lines and I've highlighted my main points on my waveform and you'll notice the main peak is now up 500 millivolts from where it was before and the bottom peak of my waveform is now up 500 millivolts from where it was before. So once you put in the zero crossing points and the peak points, you can then sketch in your waveform. And I've labeled my waveform as channel 1 plus 500 millivolts. Volts per division for channel 1, 500 millivolts. Channel 2 is crossed out because I'm not displaying it. And I still have my horizontal setting at 250 microseconds. So finishing off step 11, we're going to return the function generator back to a sine wave and remove any DC offset. You can remove the DC offset by pushing in the DC offset button on the function generator. So under procedure, step 12, we're going to show you how to use the cursor button and the cursor bars to take more precise measurements. So for this exercise, we're just going to be using channel 1. So you can press the channel 2 menu button to turn off channel 2 if it's displayed on your screen. Press the channel 1 menu button again to bring up the channel 1 menu items on the side and make sure your coupling is returned to AC. So pressing in the cursor button brings up the cursor menu on the side and we can control the cursors by using the vertical position knobs. So on your screen you can see the type is off and the source is channel 1. So we're going to change the type to voltage. And now you can see there are two lines on the screen. One is at the top, one is at the bottom. If you change the vertical position knob for cursor 1, you can see the bottom waveform moves up and down. So we can change it to the bottom of the waveform. So it's just touching the bottom of the waveform. 
then using the vertical position for cursor 2 we can move the second bar up and down and we can move it to the top of the waveform so you can see that cursor 1 is at minus 1.02 volts so that's the bottom peak cursor 2 is at 1 volt so that's the top peak and the delta 2.02 .02 volts is the peak to peak voltage we can press the type menu button again and it'll change from voltage to time we can adjust the vertical position for cursor 1 to be at a zero crossing line and we can adjust the vertical position knob for cursor 2 to the other zero crossing line and you can see cursor 1 is at minus 520 microseconds cursor 2 is at plus 500 microseconds the delta is 1.02 milliseconds which works out to 980.4 Hertz under procedure step 13 we're going to show you how to use the measure button to bring up all the measurements of your waveform so to move on to step 13 I'm going to turn off my cursors and I'm going to go to channel 1 and make sure my coupling is AC and my probes on one times I'm going to go to channel 2 now that brings in the channel 2 waveform my coupling is AC and my probe is one times I'm now going to press the measure button and you can see it brings up the measure menu down the side of the screen the first box is source or type and you can see type is highlighted and all the highlighted options down the screen say none if I change the source type button by pressing it I'm now selecting source and you can see channel 1 is highlighted all the way down on the bottom item here if I press its menu button it changes to channel 2 press it again channel 1 so on the last item leave it at channel 2 now where it says source type I'll press its menu button it's now on type so for channel 1 I'm gonna press its menu button and it brings up frequency of 983 Hertz on the next channel 1 I'm gonna press its menu button it brings up frequency I press it again and it now brings up the period of one millisecond now on the last channel 1 measure item I'm gonna press its menu button and it brings up frequency period, mean, and peak to peak. And if I keep going, it will cycle through all the options. So leave it at channel 1, peak to peak. And on channel 2, I'm going to change it to peak to peak. So now you can see the measure function gives me the channel 1 frequency and period and channel 2 is going to have the same frequency and period we can see that visually on the oscilloscope screen channel 1 peak to peak is at 2 volts and we know that we had 1 volt peak channel 2 is at 1.52 volts which means it peaks at about 750 millivolts now on the TDS 1002 the measure buttons work a little bit differently so going from my standard waveforms if I press the measure button 
you can see I have the measure menu down the side of my screen and channel 1 says none, channel 1 none, channel 1 none, channel 1 none, channel 1 none. So there's actually one, two, three, four, five readings I can take on the TDS 1002 and there was only four readings I could take on the TDS 210. So on the top item here for channel 1, if I press the menu button, you can see now it says source is channel 1 and the type is none. So I'm going to change the type to frequency and it gives me a frequency reading down here. And now I have a back button. So if I press back, you can see I now have channel 1 frequency. I press its menu button. Source is channel 1, type none, so I press the type menu button and I can bring up the period. And now I have to press back again. So now I've got frequency and period. Now on the last one, I can press the button. It says source, type, change the type to peak to peak. Then press back again. So now I have channel 1 frequency, channel 1 period, and channel 1 peak to peak. Now on this channel 1, I'm going to press its menu button. And now the source I'm going to change to channel 2. And the type I'm going to change to peak to peak. And then I'm going to press back. So just like on the TDS 210, I now have channel 1 frequency, channel 1 period, channel 1 peak to peak and channel 2 peak to peak and I'm not going to bother with my last setting. So while the measure menu saves us a lot of time taking readings it's very important that we have the waveform showing at least one cycle on the oscilloscope screen. I'm going to change my seconds per division And notice the waveform is just going off the edge of the screen. So it's not exactly one complete cycle. And you'll notice all my readings have changed to question marks for frequency and period because it's not displaying a complete waveform on the screen. Now I'm going to change my volts per division until the waveform goes off the screen. And you'll notice it's trying to take a reading, but it has a question mark beside it. So to take any of these measurements correctly, the waveform must be shown on the screen. Both vertically and horizontally, they must be able to be displayed on the screen for the measurements to work correctly. Under procedure, step number 14, it says finally a snapshot of the screen may be saved for future work using the USB port and a USB memory stick. This is not available on our oscilloscopes. When you've completed the lab, show it to your instructor so that they may initial it to indicate that it is complete.